Well, we're continuing on in our uh, Health Check series today. How many know that the human mind is an incredible thing? How many know that? How many know that your mind is amazing? Sometimes I'm amazed at my mind. I'm amazed. Like, out of my mind, sometimes there are just moments of brilliance that just amaze me. You know? And, and like, there's times when, you know, Holly will say, you know, like, what, like, what made you think of that? How did you come up with that idea? And the creativity is astounding. It's just a moment of brilliance. And, and I say, I don't know. It just came to me. Right? But how do you know, out of my same mind, out of the same place where all that brilliance comes from, sometimes there's just like a brain cramp, right? And sometimes my wife will say to me, like, what were you thinking? Right? And I just say, I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. It, it made sense in the moment. Have you ever had it made sense in the moment? I was making mashed potatoes one time, and, and I know my mom always put a little bit of milk in there to make them fluffy. And, and I, was, I was a single uh, before we got married, and, and so I thought, well, I need a dairy product, and I don't have any milk. So cream cheese, that's a dairy product. And I put that in the potatoes. Not a moment of brilliance. That was disgusting. You know, it was like, uh, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, as a youth pastor one time, we were doing a slip and slide, and I went to the store. And we used to do junior high one night, and we'd do youth the following night. And so I went and bought all the supplies. In my moment of brilliance, I thought, you should buy it all at once. All, like, both nights, buy it all at once. So I bought up all the, the Dawn dish soap they had at the dollar store. I bought it all up, and uh, it was amazing. The junior highs loved it. It was a great night on the slip and slide. But what I didn't realize is that we used up all the dish soap. And so the next day I went to the store and I realized that uh, there was something cheaper than dish soap. It was the laundry detergent was on sale. And so I thought, you know, this is brilliant. I can save money buying big jugs of laundry. And so we poured it out on the slip and slide and the high schoolers are on there. And then all of a sudden they were like, my eyes are burning. Oh, my skin. Oh, like, and I'm like, suck it up, you guys. Like the junior highs did it last night. And I didn't realize that uh, laundry soap had a lie in it. And so well, I had parents calling me the next day. They, my kid is blind. You need to come and pray healing <laughs> over my kid, right? Just not a moment of brilliance. You know, the human mind's incredible. Would you just say this with me? Say, my mind is amazing. <laughs> your mind is amazing. Take, for instance, your memory. How do you know that your memory is amazing? <laughs> Some people are like, oh, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, have you ever run into storage issues? Like on your phone or your computer, you ever gone to like be taking a picture and I would say like your storage is full, like you can't take the picture, you need to unload some apps or you gotta, I, I hate that, I'm not really a computer guy, like I'm pretty tech savvy, I get by pretty good, but I don't really know how it works, I just like it to work the way it's supposed to work, right? And, and so sometimes I, I'm doing stuff and it'll be like your, your memory is full, you need to like buy more storage and, and so I, I paid for, I have like online storage, virtual storage. I store all my junk virtually online. Isn't that amazing? I don't go through my photos and take the best ones. I just take lots and lots of photos. I store them online in my online storage space. Isn't that amazing? You have like virtual junk that we're paying for now. It's, it's incredible, right? How many of you would love the excuse? You go to work tomorrow and you're like, I'm sorry, boss. I got to leave this meeting. My, my storage space is full <laughs> in my mind, right? Hey, kids, you're in class tomorrow. I got to go home lunchtime. The memory bank is full. I got to go. How many would love that excuse? Well, unfortunately, it's never likely to happen. Uh, Dr. Paul Reber, this is, he's a professor of, uh, professor of psychology at Northwestern. This is what he says about our mind. He says, we can't really know, but the way the mind processes stores and uh, handles memory, but they estimate the brain capacity is somewhere close to 2.5 petabytes. 2.5 petabytes. Now, what's a petabyte? It would be the equivalent of 2.5 million gigabytes. Your mind is incredible. And this is what he says. He says, for comparison, if your brain was like a DVR for your TV, 2.5 petabytes would be enough to hold 3 million hours of TV. You'd have to leave the TV running continuously for 300 years to watch all that was on your mind. How many know that the mind is an incredible thing? Now, some of you are wondering, like, I got to check my warranty because I just like... <laughs> I feel like, you know, like I walk into the room and I can't remember what I'm here for, right? Like, it's just like, 
the mind is incredible. You know, it might come as a surprise to you that in ancient Near Eastern cultures, uh, like we read in the Old Testament with the Hebrews, they didn't really have a concept of the brain and its function. They, they thought more of the heart and the internal organs, you know, primarily the heart and the kidneys. The heart was, you know, where the thoughts came from and the kidneys were the emotions. Imagine that at Valentine's. I love you with all my kidneys, right? <laughs> Just, that's the way they thought. Uh, John Walton, uh, he says this. He says, for example, in the ancient world, people believed that the seat of intelligence, emotion, and personhood was in the internal organs, particularly the heart, but also the liver, kidneys, and intestines. Many Bible translations use the English word mind when the Hebrew text refers to the entrails, showing the ways in which language and culture are interrelated. So for example, Psalm 26.2 in the Hebrew says, would you search my heart and my kidneys, O Lord? That's the way it's written in Hebrew. Now to us, our understanding, we translate that to mind because we've had a, a shift in the way things are, are thought through. Uh, this cardiocentric or heart-based uh, um, uh, thinking was a prevailing understanding. If you were to go to the Greek philosopher Aristotle, as, as brilliant as he was, he didn't understand the mind, the brain. He thought the brain was the place the blood went to cool. That's how they thought, you know, in Greek thought. Well, that began to progress by the 5th century BCE. BCE. Uh, as philosophers like Hippocrates, uh, you know, Hippocrates, that's where you get the Hippocratic Oath from and his exploration of medicine, Hippocrates, and another guy named uh, Alcmeon of Croton. There's a name for your next baby, Alcmeon of Croton. Just imagine this guy. And, uh, and so they began to propose this, what they call encephalocentric. Not cardiocentric, but encephalocentric, meaning from the mind, uh, encephalocentric understanding of the body. They began to put two and two together that our thoughts and our processes were coming from the mind. So I tell you all that to be a free history lesson and a little bit of uh, Bible basis, basics for the Old Testament. But really I want us to know that humanity has been on a quest to understand and make sense of ourselves for a long time. We've been trying to understand ourselves and our processes uh, for as long as we've been in existence. And so today I know that we think of our thoughts as being from our mind and our emotions being from our heart. But either way, God's got us covered. And Philippians 4, 7 says, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, over the past few weeks, we've been in this series called Health Check, and we've been taking an analysis. We've been looking at some of the gauges and trying to get a pulse on some of the areas of our life to determine uh, how we are contributing to our spiritual vitality. And so we talked in week one, Dr. Marge talked about spiritual health, and we talked about marriage and relationships. We talked about finance. Last week, we started talking about emotional and mental health. And so when we talk about mental health, Really what we're talking about, not just our mind, but we're talking about our well-being. It's encompassing our emotions and our thoughts. It's our feelings and our our contentedness with our ability to interact with the world around us, to solve problems and overcome difficulties. When we talk about being a good mental health, we're, we're content with the way that we are processing the things that are happening in us and around us. Now, mental illness, often we see mental health and mental illness sort of inter- interchange, but mental illness is a state of being affected in the way that you think, feel, behave, and interact with others. And so we know that health, just like physically, uh, there's a continuum. It's not like you're either like, like good mentally or, or mental health or, or negative mental health. There's a continuum of mental health. And, and on this spectrum, uh, you could be either in great or good or poor uh, or even into mental or to illness and then even into disorder and disability. And so throughout our lifetime, we all experience situations and setbacks that influence our well-being. You know, if you've ever worked for like a really uh, demanding boss or a really stressful workplace situation, uh, Kirsten, don't say anything right now, uh, you know, but you know that can raise your level of stress and anxiety being in a situation like that. We, we know that a loss of a loved one or a change in a relationship, even traumatic experiences all go towards affecting uh, our mental and emotional health. Uh, Last week, we just said the Center for Addiction and Mental Health said that in any year, one in five Canadians experience mental illness. 
They say that by the age 40, over 50% of Canadians will have experienced mental illness at some point in their life. The group that's most likely to be affected by mental illness are young people, age 15 to 24. And uh, 39% of high school students uh, report uh, a moderate to serious level of psychological distress, meaning that they have anxiety or depression. So it's safe to say that whether it's ourselves or our family, whether it's people in our classroom and our coworkers or our church, uh, we all know and love people who have been struggling with emotional and mental health. Now, these might seem like buzzwords. Uh, we talked about this last week, the fact that we hear a lot about that now. And, uh, uh, but Scripture is replete. There's so many instances where God uh, is addressing this. We think of King David. All, most of his psalms are emotional pleas to God, either from a place of deep pain and anguish or from a place uh, of joy and satisfaction. Uh, we know Job suffered depression following the great loss that he endured. We, we see and take comfort from the prophet Elijah who after his interaction with Queen Jezebel felt so hopeless and defeated that that he told the Lord that he wanted to die. And so here's what we need to know that no matter our experience on the spectrum of emotional or mental health, you're in great company. See, the Bible is a story of imperfect and at times mentally unhealthy people pursuing a perfect God a God who brings hope and wholeness and healing even in the darkest of moments. I want you to know today that it's not a sin to be sick. It's not a lack of faith to struggle with mental illness. This is what I believe about mental illness the same way I believe about every illness, physical illness, and this is what I believe about healing. That God heals in three ways. He heals naturally, he heals medically, and he heals miraculously. The Bible has designed our bodies and our minds to function in a natural state where we are able to heal ourselves in the sense that if you got a cut today, your body would heal itself. There's a natural process to healing, and that's God. God's created you that way. God uses the medical system and the wonders of of our medicine and our doctors. The more we learn, the more we are able to treat and help ourselves. That's God using the medical system. And God also sometimes shows up in miraculous ways. That's all God. Sometimes we just think that the God root is miraculous. But God is functioning in all of those ways, whether it's physical or mental. And so, as I said last week, my expertise isn't in psychology or behavioral studies. It's not in clinical practice. And I appreciate and honor and respect all of those uh, who are called to serve and to to dive in those areas. My calling is to uh, be a pastor and a shepherd. And so I approach everything through the lens of the gospel and the application of scripture. So that's what I want us today. Uh, I want us to go to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to unpack the verses surrounding that one I read just a moment ago, that God would guard our hearts and minds with his peace. Now, I just want to be transparent with you. I really was wrestling this week, more so than any other week. Pastor Holly was watching me, you know, as I was studying, and and it's kind of like, I just really wanted to do justice to this topic. You know, I know this is just a topic that I feel is really relevant to our culture. I, I felt, in, and, and I just really wanted to make sure that I wasn't oversimplifying a complex and nuanced conversation. And, and I felt really, to be honest with you, like the more I dug into the topic of, of the, the brain and mental health and emotional health and, and all this other, it's kind of like the deeper I went, the, the more burdened and bogged down I felt. Right? I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you kind of get so buried in complexity, you know, and, and you're just kind of like, okay, God, I just need to like come up for air and kind of, and, 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 and this is what I've discovered, that when it comes to the gauges that we check and the practices that promote emotional and mental health, they're fairly straightforward. They're, they're a little simpler than sometimes we that we want to admit. Sometimes we're looking for something so complex, but it, the answer is much simpler. Not that they're simplistic, but they're simple. When we come to mental and emotional health, our experts tell us that the way to do, uh, to practice and to uh, accommodate mental and emotional health is to put into place healthy practices uh, with the things that we can control. As we go to anxiety and stress levels that are, you know, overwhelming in our culture, 
Uh, this is what I've found. They largely come uh, from one of two areas, two contributing factors, really. And it's, it's not dealing with the things that we can control, or it's trying to control the things that we weren't ever meant to control. When you think about it, not dealing with the things that we can control and trying to control the things we can't control, that's the largest uh, contributor to stress and anxiety in our minds. You would be amazed at the number of people that I talk to and they say, you know, Pastor Jerry, I'm just in a financial mess. You know, I, I, I just, I'm, I need financial help. And I say, okay, well, tell me, where are you at? You know, wh- what does your budget look like? Well, I don't know, You're right? And, and, and I was there for a, as a young man for a little while. I say, it was, it was easier not to know than to face and confront the issue. Have you ever known someone that, like, in your life, like, can I borrow some money? You're like, well, like, where are you at? You know, I, I don't really know. I, I would get so stressed out trying to figure out where I was at that I'd rather not know and not deal with it uh, and, and, and live with the stress of, of being in that tension. That, you know, and, and here's what I want you to know, that, you, that God can't heal or God can't, can't lean into what you won't confront in your life. But you won't confront what you refuse to acknowledge. God can't lean in and bring healing in that place. So we need, to, we need to control the things that are controllable. And at the same time, we need to let go of the things that we can't control. We're so worried about the future. And so we see our experts telling us, you know, exercise, get your body moving. Eat in a way that fuels your body for health. Sleep. Get plenty of rest. Be, get outside for the fresh air and sunshine. Be in community. Don't do life alone. These are the contributing factors that they say will help you be on the route to emotional and mental health. Here's what I want us to know today. You can't always determine the direction of your life, but what you can influence is tomorrow's trajectory by today's habits. You can't determine the direction of your life, but you can influence tomorrow's trajectory by today's habits. Like, let me just give you an example. Uh, I like to golf. I'm not really much of a golfer. But here's what I've learned about golfing, is that I can't necessarily determine where my ball is going to go. I've had my ball bounce off of golf carts and hit trees and, and ricochet in all kinds of different places. That's the kind of golfer I am, really, uh, to be honest with you. I can't affect, I can't determine where my ball is going to go because sometimes there's outside influences. But what I've learned from my limited experience, I've never taken a golf lesson, so please don't critique me today or, you know, criticize me. But what I've learned is the way that I set up for my shot is going to help, is going to influence where my ball goes, right? The, the straighter I get my feet and the straighter I hit my shot, the more likely my ball is going to go the direction I want it to go, right? Like if I'm trying to shoot over to these people over here and I'm hacking this way and hacking that way, you know, I watch my kids mini golf and like the ball is ricocheting. All, it's like you got to duck for cover, you know, and it's like they're hacking, they're, they're shooting and your feet, like when I, I watched on YouTube uh, how to do a golf lesson and the, the instructor took his club and so you got to make sure your feet are lined up and, and I'll, I'll do some lessons afterwards if you want to come to me. And, <laughs> and so... I can't determine where my ball's going to go, but I can influence it the best I can by lining up as straight as I can be. And so what I want us to know is like, like these are the habits that we're doing today on my backstroke. What I'm doing today is going to influence where my ball goes tomorrow, right? What I'm doing today is going to influence the direction that my life is going to head tomorrow, I can't determine tomorrow's direction. There's uh, things that are outside of my control. There are situations that I can't affect. But I can influence the tomorrow's trajectory by today's habits. I want to talk today about three habits today that will promote emotional and mental health tomorrow. The first one is so simple. It's this, take every care to prayer. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Don't worry about anything, the Bible says. Maybe your version says, be anxious for nothing. That's a tall order because I know we've all been worried and anxious at some point in our life. 
Here's the thing about our emotions. Emotions are God-given to us for a reason. They serve a purpose in our life. Our emotions are signals that alert us to the surroundings or circumstances around us. And when they're healthy, our emotions will trigger an appropriate response in us. Just think of the, like, disgust for a moment, right? It would be terrible if you were to look at me this morning and be, like, disgusted. Oh, like, what's, uh, if you reacted to me that way, I'd be like, oh, that's maybe not the right response, right? But if you were drinking milk that had gone sour, right, disgust would be like, Ugh! you would spit it out, and it would be like, it would stop you from consuming something, from ingesting something that could hurt you. Anger is an appropriate response when it causes us to confront something that's not right, right? It causes us to confront issues and make right things that aren't right. Love, as an emotion, causes us to seek out and to foster relationships. Our emotions are, are meant to alert us and trigger us to respond in an appropriate way. Now, take, for example, if I was to bring out a lion today. Can you bring out my... No, I'm just kidding. I don't have a lion. But if I was to bring out a lion, some of you would be like, I'm a little anxious, right? I'm a little maybe even fearful. Fearful would be an appropriate response if I had a lion on the stage today because your body would be alerting to you that there might be something out of the ordinary. I don't know if Pastor Jared has that lion trained or not. I might need to fight or flight, you know, my way out of here, Right? And so the emotion of fear would be an appropriate response to get your body ready to say there might be fight or flight. Uh, we got to be paying attention to this. The issue with anxiety, see, fear is a healthy emotion in response to an actual threat. The issue with anxiety is that it's an emotional response to a perceived or presumed threat, right? We don't know for sure what's going to happen, but we're going to presume that the worst is about to happen. And when we live in that place, we can't stop thinking about it, we can't stop dwelling, we can't stop stewing about it. The, the word uh, translated here, worry, be anxious or worried for nothing, is uh, the word merimeo. Mer I practiced it last night and I messed it up. Merimeo in the Greek. And it has this connotation of being divided of being torn or pulled in two different directions. It has this connotation of, of having a hope pulling me in one direction and fear pulling me in another. That's really what anxiety and worry is doing, isn't it? It's tearing us apart. It's funny as I get, I love words. I'm a word guy. If you're a word guy or a word girl, uh, the word worry, often if you're reading Old English, we have this etymology. Where do our words come from? In Old English, the word worry comes from the word worgen. And worgen means to choke or to strangle. How many know that worry does that to us? Doesn't it sometimes feel like worry is choking us and strangling us, right? Left unchecked, it can be suffocating to the place that all hope and peace and joy feels like it's being squeezed out of us, isn't it? And so the first part of Paul's prescription in maintaining emotional mental health is take every care to prayer. And I just want to say, like, gee, Paul, thank you so much for your genius insight, right? Like, like how many know that when you're worried or anxious, the least helpful thing someone can do is just to say, stop it, right? Just stop it. Don't do that, right? You're like, gee, I wish I would have thought of that myself, right? Now, here's the thing. Before we think Paul is being simplistic here, before we think that Paul is being naive, I want us to recognize the, prescript, uh, the position he's in. He's prescribing this from a place of experience himself. He's not naive. Uh, he's got some cares of his own. In this chapter, in verse 2, we'll see that he's actually writing the Philippians, uh, a church that he's planted and that he's passed off, and he's writing to them with concern because there's two women in the church who are squabbling, two women who are fighting, and, uh, and they're in this place where Euodia and Syntyche, they've been disagreeing about something, and Paul's concerned that other people are going to begin to take sides, and there's going to be a division or a split within this fledgling church that he's planted. He's got some, some real valid concerns. And to top it off, he's writing to them about his concerns from a Roman prison. 
This isn't Paul living his best life saying, hey, don't worry about anything. Just take it to God in prayer. He's actually in this place of saying, hey, I'm not naive. I'm not simplistic. He said, I want you to actually know that I've put this into practice and I've experienced the peace that passes all understanding. I've experienced this for myself. I'm not just saying, just stop it. I'm saying, this works. This works. Uh, he's, he's saying, I, I, I've got a lot to be anxious and worried about, but I've tried it, I've lived it, I've experienced it. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts, your emotions, and your mind, your thoughts, as you live in Christ Jesus. Here's why prayer is a perfect antidote to anxiety. It's not just throwing up a prayer, like, okay, like, hey, God, uh, you know, got this need, you know, that's it. He said when we actually engage in prayer, it's the antidote to anxiety. See, worry or anxiety is rooted in myself. When I look at myself, uh, I'm in a place of anxiety and worry, but prayer takes the focus off of me and puts it on to God. It's rooted in God. See, anxiety has this limited view where all I can see right now are the complexities of the problems that are around me. But when I go to prayer, I'm actually uh, going to God who in his infinite wisdom, in his infinite power, in his omnipresence is bigger than my problem. When I'm looking at my issue, it seems so big. But then when I look up in comparison, today I walked into the office and Pastor Riley was laughing because in his office there was a life-size cutout of Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Now, you might not know this, Pastor Riley, he's a bit of a fanboy for The Rock. And, and, uh, and so he walked into this life-size portrait of the, I don't know if you've ever seen The Rock on TV. He's pretty muscular. He's big. And so, and so uh, I asked Riley, Riley, you want me to take a picture? Someone had blessed him with this. And, uh, and so I said, you want me to take a picture of you with your new gift? And so he stood beside The Rock, and, and they got a picture together. But, but besides the, beside The Rock, Pastor Riley, you know, like he, he's, he's strong. He's He's kind of wiry, really, to be honest with you. You know, he's still got that youthful strength, right? Where he's still thin and wiry. You know, he hasn't got that dad bod yet and uh, whatever. But, but, but beside the rock, as big as Riley is, he seemed a little small, right? And, and, and so what I'm saying is that when I look at me and my anxiety and worry, and then I look at God and his strength, how many know that God is overwhelmingly above and and bigger than my problems. That's what prayer does. See, prayer, uh, anxiety is rooted in this horizontal focus. Like all I can see is my inability and my lack of resource to deal with the issue at hand. But when I pray, I'm lifting my eyes above my problem and I'm looking at God and his infinite power and his infinite resource to do above and beyond anything that I can ask or imagine. When I'm in anxiety, I'm being controlled by my circumstances and my problems. But when I come to prayer, I'm being reminded that God is sovereign and he is in control of everything. When I come to anxiety, my expression is this perceived fear of all that could go wrong. But when I come to prayer, I come to this expression of faith that no matter what's going on around me, God, I know that you are good and you are in control. It's not just that we say like this quick prayer that just kind of like, all right, I prayed about it. But Paul's saying, really come to prayer and really let God transform the way you're thinking. And, and, and notice that the promise of prayer here, it doesn't say that necessarily everything always is an answer, yes. It's not that we always get deliverance from our situations, but that it says the promise of prayer is the peace of God. The promise of God is uh, the promise of prayer isn't always the provision we're asking for, but the promise of God is always the peace of God that comes with His presence, and it exceeds anything we can understand. How many of you have ever been in a moment where you just say, "I, I don't know, I, I don't, I just feel this peace." You know, everything around me can be in turmoil. I can be in the middle of the storm, but I have this peace inside of me that I, I don't know. I just have this confident trust 
in Jesus. Prayer doesn't always change our circumstances, but it changes our perspective and reminds us of God's presence in spite of our circumstances. Take every care to prayer. The second thing he says this, he says, make your thoughts a thermostat and not a thermometer. Make your thoughts a thermostat and not a thermometer. Verse 8 says, now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Everyone say, fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Now, you understand the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer, right? If you have a thermometer, all it does is it goes up and down. It changes and fluctuates with the circumstances around it, right? Whatever's happening in the room, that's what's affecting the thermometer to change. It goes up and it goes down depending on really atmospheric pressure and the temperature of the room. How many know a thermostat isn't affected by what's happening in the room? It's the one that actually sets the tone for what's going on. We have a thermostat downstairs in our office that's broken. And when I say broken, we can program it, but every day can be programmed, but for some reason it won't let us select Tuesday. Tuesday, it won't let us, you know, change the date. And so we have staff meeting on Tuesdays, and the heat on Tuesdays is set to 22 and a half. Now, every other day, it's 20 and a half. But Tuesdays, when we walk in to staff meeting, we open that, uh, that meeting room door. It's like a sauna. Just like, and it, like, it just wafts over us. It, it won't, like, I've tried it many times. The button won't select Tuesday. But this is what happens. The thermostat, it doesn't care if it's 12 degrees outside or if it's, you know, minus 12 degrees outside. It sets the room temperature to 22 and a half every Tuesday because that's what it's set on, Right? How many know that in our lives, when we are fixed our thoughts, when we are set on a certain thing, that's what determines the temperature of our lives. I'm not uh, controlled by what's going on around me. My, my inner peace and my satisfaction uh, doesn't go up and down depending on life circumstances because my mind, my thoughts are set on the things of God. Craig Grishel says this. He says, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. What we think shapes who we are. Now, I'm not talking just about the power of positive thinking. That's not what I'm talking about. But we actually see this principle so many times throughout Scripture. Romans 12, 2 says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You'll keep at perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Colossians 3.2 says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. 2 Chronicles, uh, Corinthians 10.5 says, Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Ephesians 4.23 says, Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Romans uh, 8, 5, and 6. Let's read this together. Romans 8, 5, and 6. Two verses. Let's read them together. Okay, one, two, three. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please God. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Where we let our minds go determines where our hearts go and where our mental health goes. Right? Well, unhealthy thinking leads to unhealthy feeling. Now, I know that there is a mental illness. I know there, there's mental uh, disability. And there's some factors that contribute, whether it's, you know, hormonal and, and all kinds of different things. There's traumatic experiences. Like I said, I can't always determine where my golf ball goes. Sometimes it hits things and ricochets in places that, that I can't predetermine. But what this is saying is that I can affect the trajectory of my life by the habits that I'm doing today, by, by renewing my mind and letting my mind be focused on the things of God. I'm setting myself up in the most healthiest of ways. Set your mind on things of the Spirit. See, what we think about shapes who we are. Are we going to be worriers? Are we going to be worshipers? Are we going to be anxiety-filled? Are we going to be uh, peace-filled? 
See, instead of letting our peace of mind and our emotions fluctuate depending on our circumstances and our situations like a thermometer, we have to set our minds. Set our minds on the things that bring peace. Set our minds on the things that bring confident hope in who Jesus is and who, what Jesus says uh, about us. How do we set the thermostat of our minds? As, as simple as ABC. You, you know I love to alliterate. So here we go. A, ask, is this thought from God? The Bible says we've got to set our minds. We've got to take captive every thought. Say, is this thought from God? Then I gotta be, I gotta go to the Bible and say, what does God's word say about this? What does God's word say about it? I gotta be continuously in this place of renewing my mind, filling my mind with scripture. And then I need to contemplate. I need to meditate on God's word. I can memorize God's word. And then I can reflect on what changes can I make in the way I'm thinking or in the, in the actions I'm taking to align myself with God's word. Word. That's how we set the thermostat of our mind. Take every care to prayer. Make your mind a thermostat, not a thermometer. And the last one is this, practice godly living. Verse 9 says, keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, and then the God of peace will be with you. You know, we've heard that saying many times, that practice makes perfect. Uh, I used to play basketball in high school, and my coach would always say, practice doesn't make perfect. He would say, perfect practice makes perfect. And he would make us do it again and again until he got it right. He was just saying to us that we keep practicing things, uh, and we keep uh, reinforcing our bad habits, and thus we were practicing perfectly. And so we got to continue to practice godly living. Oh, I said at the start is that many of our stress and anxieties come from not doing the things that are in our power to control uh, and, and trying to do things and trying to control things we weren't meant to control. Last week, as we started out in week one, we talked about making ourselves right with God. We can't keep hiding from God. The Bible says that we actually are searing our consciousness, our conscience. We're, we're searing ourselves to the promptings of God when we live in opposition from him. When we live in that place where we're continuously hiding and we're trying to justify ourselves, uh, we actually live with this place of stress, our cortisol levels, all that. If you've ever uh, lived in a, in a state of sin, you know that you're actually programming yourself to be in that place. What he's saying here is that we need to be right with God. We've got to practice godly living. Keep putting it into practice. No matter your age, your maturity, no matter how long you've been serving Jesus, this is something that we've got to continuously be doing in our life, putting godly thinking and godly living into practice. In his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Pete Scazzaro talks about our lives being like an iceberg. And what he says is really 10% of our lives is what's visible on the surface. 10% is what you know, we can see and what can, people can see going on around us. But, but 90% of that iceberg is underneath the surface. 90% of it is unseen below the waters. And, and when, when this is what Pete says. He says, the degree to which we give Jesus access deep beneath the surface of our lives is the degree we will experience the freedom of living out our true self in him. When I'm faced with emotions and anxiety and a lack of peace and of anger, whatever it is, I need to look below the surface. And I, I know that these emotions are God-given signals. They're signals to alert me of my surroundings and my circumstances. They're alerting me to what's going on in my heart and in my mind. And when those signals are alerting me that something is wrong, I need to pause and I need to ask myself, what is God wanting to say? What is God wanting to show? Or what is God wanting to shape in me as a result of this warning sign, this alert? I know it seems simple. Paul says, don't worry about anything. Just stop it. He, he's not saying just stop it. He's just saying, let that be a warning sign, an alert to you that God is wanting to say something. God's wanting to show you something. He's wanting to shape something in your life. It's not that you need to feel guilty about it. Say, like, oh, I live in this place of anxiety. Where No, take that care to God. Say, God, what is it that you're trying to show me? What do I need to change about the way I'm thinking? What do I need to change about the way I'm acting? What can I do to put into place a healthy pattern 
What do you want to do in me? I'm going to invite you to stand this morning all across this room. And, and I pray today that God would be ministering to you. I, I pray today that God would be just taking a burden off your shoulders. Maybe you're here and you're like, you know, anxiety and worry, that's been something I've struggled with for years. This morning I want to say, what, what would God want to say to you, show you or shaping you through that? There's no guilt, there's no shame. That's a warning sign that just says, come to me. Come to me if you're healthy or unhealthy. Maybe it's been a, a, a temporary circumstance or just something that, you know, is, is fleeting in your life that's triggered you and you say, I, I need to come to Jesus. Maybe you've been in this pattern. Maybe you've been in this place that it's been a constant uh, battle for you. Jesus is saying, come to me this morning. God, I just thank you today all across this room that you love us and you care for us, that your grace is extended to, uh, to us, God. God, thank you today that how we're doing isn't determined by how things are going around us. God, I thank you today that even though our situations may not change, we can still flourish because of your peace that passes all understanding and your presence that assures us you care and love for us. God, I just thank you that our problems aren't more powerful than your peace. And I just thank you today that your peace comes with your presence. And so I pray this morning for everyone in this place, God, whether we would say we are in a great state of mental health, maybe we're in a, a poor state, maybe we're somewhere in between, maybe we're battling mental illness, but I pray today by the power of your spirit that your peace would reign and rest in this place, Jesus. A peace that passes understanding. God, a, a peace that's not dictated by circumstances. God, a, a peace that's not predicated on everything going according to plan, but Jesus, a peace that comes from your presence today. In the power, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 